Welcome to the Movie Geeks United 30th Anniversary Celebration of Tim Burton's Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Thanks to our sister show, Back by Midnight, and its host, Arenada Diaz, we bring you a duo of interviews with key talents involved in the film. First, actress Elizabeth Daly, who played Pee-wee's love interest in the film. Then, acclaimed production designer David L. Snyder. Enjoy. From Danny Elfman's jangling score to the pop pop art colors and set design to Paul Rubin's iconic characterization of the ultimate man-child, Pee-wee Herman, Pee-wee's Big Adventure is a postmodern live-action cartoon that paved the way for everything from The Simpsons to Family Guy to Wes Anderson. As Dottie, the bike store worker who just wanted to go to the drive-in with Pee-wee, Singer, songwriter, actress E.G. Daly was funky and off-kilter enough to convince she would be interested in someone like Pee Wee. Daly has been a recording artist for nearly 30 years, with songs appearing on such iconic soundtracks to movies as Scarface and Better Off Dead. Her film appearances include Valley Girl, Streets of Fire, and The Devil's Rejects, but Daly is probably best known as the voice of Tommy Pickles on the animated TV series Rugrats. I spoke with Ms. Daly early last week about her career and her experiences on Tim Burton's Nightmare, uh, Tim Tim Burton's Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Here is my interview with Ms. E.G. Daly. What came first, the uh, singing or the acting? Well, I would say probably the um, the singing because I, I could open my mouth and sing freely at any time, but right. the um, but the acting was more of like an acquired. You know, I had to I had to kind of really learn how to become a a better actor. You know, with something that you know I just it wasn't my it wasn't my nature to really just expose myself to people or just allow myself to just let let myself out of my little shell. But singing um, with singing, I could do that. Which is why I think voiceovers took off so much because it sort of was a combination of the two, but it didn't require, as, you know, I didn't have to physically expose myself like you do on acting. So right. I would say the, the singing first. And some of your earlier roles, like you know, Streets of Fire, they kind of always they seem to have a musical component to them. Yeah, I even though even, like even though I mean you weren't singing, but you know there was a musical element already to them. Definitely, but it was, um, yeah, it was also frustrating for me, to be honest, like during those periods where I would have those roles in movies where I got cast in roles where I didn't get to sing, I felt frustrated. <laughs> right. But uh, to be honest, you know, I always remember feeling frustrated. Um, nowadays, I usually end up getting to do all of the singing and the acting as well, but back in those days, they sort of knew me sometimes more as the actor. Right. Um, there were people that knew me as the singer, but I seemed to get a lot of parts in movies where there was music going on. And I would watch some training actors that couldn't sing, and I'd be like, pick me, pick me. <laughs> and um, and then also, I mean, you know, for, for some of our listeners who may not know that, you know, part of trivia is that you, you were into the singing before the acting, and in some of your songs, uh, almost out of the gate, you were, you were on kind of iconic soundtracks. I mean, I believe... You have two songs on the Scarface soundtrack? Yeah. Well, I started working really young when I was probably about 16. Right. Since I got my driver's license, I used to... Somehow I got introduced to Georgia Moroder, the, the famous composer who did Flash Dance and all of Donna Summers, broke Donna Summers' career and all this stuff. And somehow I got introduced to him, and then I would drive up to his house, and I started singing a lot for him. He sort of was just like, huh, who's this little girl coming up here, and... They started using me on a lot of projects, a lot of demos. I think I did a lot of demos for even Donna mm-hmm. Summer. I think I did the entire demo session for the soundtrack for the Metropolis movie. Right. And then I did. I actually did the original demo of Flash Dance instead of uh, What a Feeling. It was She's a Lady, I think, or something. It was some different title. I actually demoed that. And then after doing working with him long enough, they finally just sort of started hiring me to actually do songs on soundtracks for them, and then. You know, I'd be in the studio recording a song with um, Keith Forsey for The Breakfast Club, and then Jerry Bruckheimer would be in the next studio saying, who's singing that song? 
And we got her to sing our song or write it with Harold Fultemeyer. And the next thing you know, I was writing Beef of Hearts sing song with Harold Fultemeyer and doing that soundtrack. So it was sort of like a meant-to-be situation, and one thing led to the next. Right. Well, and uh, then you you got the uh, how did so we're here to talk about Pee Wee's Big Adventure. How did you, how did you get that role? How did that come about? Well, Pee Wee's was just a regular old audition. I mean, they were looking for someone that could be quirky with that could really conceivably be Pee Wee's girlfriend that wasn't like your typical Hollywood kind of girl. And I think I sort of had that sort of offbeat market down and went in with the long. I think it was Julie Brown, the comedian Julie Brown. Right. And, myself, and I remember seeing a handful of girls in the final casting for that. It was just a, basically a regular old casting, and I think they were just, like I said, looking for someone with a little quirky side that that wasn't so Hollywoodized, you know. Right. Kind of, more kind of down to earth, and I think that's probably why I got Dottie at that time. Yeah. And when you when you got that, I mean, I mean. Pee Wee, the character, was kind of a, a fringe underground character. Tim Burton, you know, this is his first film. So yeah. this was this was very under the radar. What did you think of the material at the time? I really had no idea. I just knew that they were, it was a major film at this point, and that, that Tim Burton, it was his first major project, and that he they showed me um, a, the footage from a, a short special that he had done about a dog that was, I guess, very hip and very um, well-received. And I remember them showing that to me, and I remember I had seen Pee Wee Herman's show at the Roxy, so I was kind of familiar with his work, and I knew that it was going to be something special. I just didn't know how big it was going to be. And I didn't know that it would go on to be Tim Burton's, you know, a big breaking scene for Tim Burton. But he's really artistic, and he's very almost like animated and in the way that he does his stuff. So... We didn't really have any idea at the time it was going to be as popular, and I didn't, you know, I had no idea. Just I remember that the sound stage was really cool, and the sets were really cool, and you know, you just go in and go, okay, well, this is really cool, and and it ended up being a a big, big blow up project, which was very cool. And uh, you know, so your scenes are all with Pee Wee Herman, you know, Paul Rubens. So I'm yeah. curious, were were those scenes? Was it a case of following the script, or were there times for, oh, did Burton and, and Paul Rubens allow for kind of riffing and improving? You know, I don't remember doing a lot of riffing and improving on that particular one. I mean, maybe a little bit, but, but it was pretty much um, shoot a script, and I think that happens more with newer situations where they're on a really tight, you know, they're being watched very carefully by the main studio, and they're being... You know, everything has to be really tight, whereas I think once people are established and proven themselves, they kind of let go of the reins a little more. I've worked with directors on both sides. I've worked with newer directors and newer writers, and I've worked with people who've been doing it a long time, and it seems like you get a little more leeway. Like, I had a lot of leeway with Rob Zombie on Devil's Reject. Right. I, I remember walking in on the set, and, and he just sort of let me go, and he was really creative. I mean, Rob would hand me new pages every day and just go, oh, here's what I came up with you for you last night. And I'd be like, huh. So he was just very free-flowing. So it really just depends on the situation. But I would tend to think that the newer, my experience is the newer projects, are they're being a little more careful. So they're going to stick a little bit more to script. Right. And so and what do you what do you remember of the first time you finally saw the film put together? I mean, because you're, you're in certain scenes, but then there's you know, all this crazy road road picture stuff. So what did you, what was yeah. your impression when you finally well, I saw it put together? It. I, I thought it was really fun, and I loved, like, the large Mars stuff, and I just thought it was great. I mean, I did watch some of it being shot. Like, I did know, like, when Pee Wee was doing the, uh, in the car with the, the jailbait guy, and they were flying down the, right. down the cliff, and I actually watched a lot of that being filmed because it was all of the sound stages, and I was around at the time, so I did get to see them filming it, but it was really cool to see it actually on film with green screen and what they actually put behind the screen, which was really fun. So I, I just, you know, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. And then they had the, this massive premiere, which was, again, another surprise, um, huge premiere. And I think Paul Rubens and I um, rode up on a, on a wagon carried by a bike rider 
I'm pretty sure that's what it was. It was a really massive premiere, but it was just amazing. You just never know, you know. I've done a lot of different films, and you never know what's going to be a big one or what's, you know. Sometimes the big ones that they're talking all about you think are going to be really huge, and those aren't the ones. And sometimes it's the one that you're not expecting anything from it or the ones that blow up. And I think Pee Wee's was one of those I just had no idea. And, um, and from a musical standpoint, what did you think when you heard Danny Elfman's iconic score? Well, I'm a huge fan of Danny Elfman, so, you know, um, I just, yeah, I mean, I I expected it to be good, actually. You know, <laughs> he's great. He's just great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have nothing to say other than he's just really super talented. Well, and then, one on a, on a final footnote, uh, not only were you in... Pee Wee's Big Adventure, where it was an acting, just straight acting, but then also that summer you cameoed as yourself in Better Off Dead as the at the uh, high school dance. And, uh, you did your homework, didn't you? <laughs> um, I'm a big fan. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious how that came how, how that came about. You know, um, that's a funny story because I think I'm trying to remember if it was uh, in this order or not, but I think I remember going into a a restaurant. And I ran into the director, um, Savage, Savage Steve Holland, and he was sitting at the table drawing cartoons on a napkin. And I remember thinking, oh, that's really cute. And I did a little voice for him, and he was like, that's perfect. And I was like, oh, thanks, you know. And I think what happened was um, it was either there or after that that I just got a call, and they had cast me to do the, uh, he actually did cast me to do some cartoons for him as well. I did Eat the Cat and and the Cozy Cozy Bears or the Cuddle Bears. I can't remember what it's called, but he's just such a great director. He just kind of like, I don't know, they just called and said, you know, we want you to do this um, singing scene at the dance. And uh, next thing you know, they were they were having wardrobe built me that crazy little dress they had me wear, which looks like a fried wonton. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I would call that my fried wonton wardrobe. And um, again, that was another little film we had no idea was going to be such an art cult classic. Um, right. You know, John Cusack was one of John Cusack's big sort of main things he started out with. So again, that was just a random running into Steve Salvatore and the director, and then him just saying, "We want you to do this thing." And that wasn't a casting or anything. Right. And where did the uh, the song come from? Was that your song, or did you write it for the movie, or? Is that something no, like- actually, there was a writer named Angie, I think it's Angie Rubin, mm-hmm. not for sure the last name, but super talented girl, and they had already had the song. She had already written the theme song, and she was a really young, talented writer. And uh, I got together with her, and we just went over it, and there was two songs in that, I think, that I did, Little Luck what? and Better Off Dead. And, yeah, they already had the songs, and that happens a lot for me, too. Sometimes, and though I'm a writer, you know, they they just they already have a song and they just call me up to sing it. Like I ended up singing a a really cool song in my sister's keeper that um, Nick Cassavetti has just directed. That was out with Cameron Diaz. Right. Actually, I'm in, I'm in the movie as well. But you know there was actually a song that they were going to get Amy Winehouse to sing. Called Life is Life is Just Full of Cherries and it was an old standard, an old cover. And I guess Amy wasn't available. And they called and said, you know. I had already shot the footage for the movie. I was already in the movie. Um, and then I, you know, they just said, oh, you know, we'd like to try you out for this thing. There was a longer story than that, but I ended up yeah. singing the song for that movie. <laughs> and do you like, uh, do you have a preference of doing your material, or do you find it kind of fun to, to work on someone else's, sing someone else's stuff and bring your own? Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I really, I really enjoy that, too. I, re- I love, of course, I love writing music and coming up with a great song for soundtrack and singing it, but I really do love singing other people's music, too. I mean, to me, um, yeah, there's something really cool about that for me, too, because I'm getting to, you know, express somebody else's music. So I really don't have a preference. I mean, other than technically it's more lucrative for me if I write the song and sing it, but... You know, being not that it's about money all the time, that it really is a fun thing for me to sing other people's right. music. I, I welcome all that. I'm just like, yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, and sometimes the songs are things I would never write, which makes it even more fun because there's things I love to sing but I would never write. So, yeah, it's a pretty cool thing to be asked to sing someone's song. 
Well, Miss uh, Miss Dale, I want to thank you for taking the time out, and it's been a terrific, terrific uh, conversation. So I want to thank My you pleasure. for. Thank, thank you. Good questions. You did your homework. It's awesome. No problem. It's my pleasure. Yeah, and everybody go check out EasyDaily.com or, yeah, EasyDaily.com is the website, or there's EasyDaily.net. They're both cool sites. Okay. Sounds Alrighty. great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The production design of Pee-wee's Big Adventure has become one of the most influential fantasy worlds in modern movie history, from the Rube Goldberg kitchen set to the tourist-friendly Alamo, to the Warner Brothers studio backlot as children's playground. The collaboration between Tim Burton and David L. Snyder has brought us a world as indelible as Oz. The Oscar-winning production designer Snyder, who I spoke to last week, uh, he won an Oscar for his uh, influential work on Blade Runner, and his other great credits include Racing with the Moon, Demolition Man, and Super Mario Brothers. Here is my interview with Oscar-winning production designer David L. Snyder. Pee-wee's Big Adventure, how did, how did that job come to you? I was working at uh, Disney Studios on a film called My Science Project with uh, uh, Fisher Stevens and John Stockwell. And Fisher Stevens, of course, just won the Academy Award for his documentary, The Cove. Right, which was also a Summer of 85 movie, uh, My Science exactly Project. Right. And and, and uh, John Stockwell, who's become a director, was in it, and uh, Danielle Van Zernick, and uh, Jonathan Taplin, uh, who had produced Mean Streets, and um, uh, as his first film, by the way, a uh, huge mm-hmm. success with Martin Scorsese. And uh, we all came together, and we were working at Disney, and uh, I was in the old animation building, and Disney was kind of strange uh, during that period because... Uh, it was still being run by the Disney family, the, the you know the real Disney family, and it was sort of slow there. They had kept the studio going by reissuing their uh, animated features every two or three years, and you know they made a lot of money. And so, up until the point when Ron Howard did uh, uh, his uh, Mermaid movie, uh, help me out here. What's the title of it? Uh, with Daryl Hannah and Tom Hanks, a wonderful flash. Yes, it's one of my favorite movies. Can't remember why I don't remember the title. In any case, made the studio realize, hey, you know what? We can make a lot more money than just re-releasing cartoons. You know, animated films every three or four years in a cycle. So uh, they brought in some new production people. I think the guy's name uh, was uh, Kim Master. Came from CBS. Maybe that's not his name, but that's what I remember. Tim Lamaster, <laughs> something like that. Look it up on IMDb. They started making movies, and so Jonathan Taplin was there, and I came in to do my science project, and as I was doing that film, had a great time. Uh, There's a guy across the hall, a very unusual young man, uh, Tim Burton, uh, and I became friends because we were sort of out of the waiting for Walt Disney to come back to life mode because most people there were, were like waiting, literally waiting for Walt to come back because, you know, they had been there their whole career. And the studio had sort of, you know, sliding and it, and it, and it was uh, worth a lot more than what was just sitting there in the vault. So Tim was doing Frankenweenie and his cameraman, Tom Ackerman, who later went on to do Beetlejuice and lots of other great movies, He was there, and so at the end of my science project, I was exhausted from going back and forth to Arizona, and uh, Tim and I talked, and, 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 you know, he had just gotten out of uh, uh, school at uh, 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 Disney uh, College, uh, trying to think of the name of it, uh, Mickey Mouse University, do you know the name of the school? So he had gone there with Paul Rubens and all that, and I didn't know Paul at the time. But uh, Tim and I became friends because we had something in common. We had an interest in more interesting things than they were doing at Disney at the time. And uh, so I finished the film and was packing up my boxes and had done something. And I had a call from a guy named Bob Shapiro, who had uh, been the former 
president uh, of Warner Brothers Pictures of Worldwide Production. He made a lot of very successful movies there. And so uh, he decided to become an independent producer uh, through a deal at Warner Brothers. And uh, so uh, this guy, Bob Shapiro, called me and said, listen, uh, I'm going to do this film uh, called Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Do you, do you know who Paul Rubens is? And I said, yeah, I kind of know, because I, I knew a lot of people from Second City and SCTV and Groundlings, you know, because I uh, did Strange Brew with Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas, uh, uh, Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield, uh, Armed and Dangerous with John Candy and Eugene Levy. So I knew a lot of those people. Uh, Gilda Radner, uh, Women in Red from Saturday Night Li uh, Live. So I knew that whole crowd and I liked them very much and had lots of fun. Sam Tennyson, all those people. And so uh, Bob said, uh, well, I'm going to do this picture. And I said, well, I'm going to go to Hawaii because I'm exhausted. And he said, well, listen, you know, T Tim really wants you because he, he doesn't know anyone else. And... Uh, he likes your work, and of course it was post Blade Runner, and that was always, you know, a nice card to play within the industry because everyone in the industry loved the movie and respected it. It was just the public that, that really, really vehemently despised the movie because <laughs> of the horrible picture it painted of the future. So. Bob said, uh, yeah, so we want you to be the production designer in this movie. And I said, well, thank you very much, but I'm, I'm going to go on a holiday. I'm, I'm exhausted. So he said, you know, uh, well, Tim doesn't really want anyone else. He only wants you. And I said, well, well that's really nice. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Tim, you know, next time. He said, and, you know, this is the first movie that I'm producing. And so... Uh, I've been a studio executive and I've been a William Morris agent, but I've never produced a movie. And, and Tim really wants you and he wants me to get you. And as a producer, you're going to make me look bad if I, if I can't get you, which was very flattering. And I said, yeah, okay, well, that's nice, but I'm, I'm tired. You know, because in those days, I was overlapping pictures because so many films were being made in Hollywood at the time, which is not the case anymore. So... He said to me, uh, Bob Shapiro said, well, you know, I, I, I talked to a lot of producers and directors about you, you know, pleading with me. And, 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 uh, and I said, yes, and, and, and I'm sure that they all said they love me. And Bob Shapiro said, no, actually, they all hate your guts, but we've decided to go with you anyway. And so I was immediately charmed by Bob Shapiro's sense of humor, and I couldn't say no, because he was so clever and so smart in talking me into it. I said, okay, I'll do it, because he, he was just, you know, and that one line, they all hate your guts, but we've decided to go with you anyway, and, and I took the job. That's how I got the job. And, you know, because, you know, Tim was in, you know, he did a lot of animation beforehand, so I'm I'm curious on that collaboration because I'm sure he had some ideas for what he wanted certain things to look like and and you had your ideas and so what was that collaboration like on Pee Wee's Big Adventure of of what the what the the movie should look like? Well that's that's very interesting and and, and, and I have the answer to that question. Uh, to begin with, when, whenever I do a movie in most cases, I begin so early because I'm the designer and it takes time to design and look at locations and make drawings and build sets. I'm usually the first person that's hired before, uh, before the cinematographer, the editor, and everyone else. It's usually myself, uh, the director, the producer, and myself, and maybe a location guy to run around town to look for locations. And so the fact of the matter was that Pee Wee Herman was an established character. I knew exactly what the lead guy was and who he was and what he looked like. Most pictures, I mean, when I was on Blade Runner, for example, Harrison Ford came months and months later after Richard Jordan turned it down, Christopher Walken turned it down. Everyone turned it down because you have to remember that at that point, 
Harrison Ford was the guy who was in Star Wars and the guy who was in American Graffiti. But he, he, he certainly wasn't, like, the first choice. In, in retrospect, he was the only choice that I think. I don't think anyone else should or could have played the role like they did. He was fabulous. But at the time, you know, Hollywood is a business, and people weren't thinking about Harrison Ford being like a box office draw. Because Indiana Jones came out in the middle of the film. The Pee Wee's Big Adventure, I knew who Paul was. I knew what he looked like. I, you know, he was a character. You know, not unlike Charlie Chaplin, whose character are the Tramp or Harry Langdon in silent films or Buster Keaton. You knew who that guy was, and you know what he did. So that kind of made my job easy. I said, okay. Uh, and Tim said, we're going to create a world for Pee Wee, but we want it to be a realistic world, uh, unlike which came to follow, which is Pee Wee's Playhouse, which is, you know, like it's a live action animated, you know, event show. So Pee Wee's world and Pee Wee's Big Adventure was going to be, he lived in a real world, which would make him more outstanding, you know, he'd, like a, he'd be the third dimension to the settings. And the settings, for the most part, were, you know, were, were, were pretty much, uh, uh, you know, generic. It wasn't like anything was wild and crazy, ex except for the dream sequences, you know. Uh, when he first wakes up in the morning uh, after the uh, uh, Tour de France, you know, like a, a fantasy sequence. And when he has his motorcycle accident, there's another fantasy sequence. Aside from that, you know, m for the most part, uh, we decided we were going to be in a anywhere USA, and if you look really closely at the film, you'll see that the license plates on all the cars that were manufactured at Warner Brothers, they all say, a nice place to live. There's no state, no city, because we wanted to make it as generic as possible. We didn't say we were in Los Angeles, and the only specific place that we ever said we were in uh, was in Texas, you know, when he went to the Alamo. From that, it's all generic. So Tim Burton uh, uh, was, was, I think, around 26 years old at the time, and, and, and he and Paul knew each other from school. So I, I was a guy that had made movies, mo feature motion pictures, and neither Tim or, or Paul had made feature motion pictures. So they wanted to get, uh, you know, a so-called veteran cinematographer and a veteran production designer and editor who was Billy Weber, to help him make his movie. And so uh, we, uh, I brought in Paul Chadwick uh, as a storyboard artist. I had worked <laughs> with him on Strange Brew and uh, Racing with the Moon with Sean Penn. And, and Paul now has his own comic book at Dark Horse. He created the character of Concrete Man. He's gone on to do that. But he worked with me on Miracle Mile. So I brought Paul in, and his storyboards were so beautiful, and I put him with Tim, and together, you know, they knocked out the entire film with storyboards, which was unusual for that time. Usually action sequences, you know. But the entire film, every shot was storyboarded because that's where Tim came from, and Paul Chadwick was the perfect guy to do it. So everyone knew what to do. So Paul and, and, and Tim and I would go down to Melrose Avenue, you know, to go shopping and we'd go look at stores and, and, and all the groovy shops there that had, you know, things that, that we wanted to look at that we thought should be part of the look of the film. Well, and so, there, are, uh, there are three sets, three distinctive sets I, I want to ask about it and tell me, you know, what you remember, what went into them and so forth. Uh, one is Pee Wee's uh, house because I mean the first sequence is really kind of it's kind of hilarious in that you know Pee Wee wakes up and he has this house and it has it's almost like a uh, uh, it's almost like a toy store and so I'm kind of curious what went into designing that house whether it was his kitchen or the dog house for for his dog Spec and what were what were some of those the decisions to make that house memorable. Okay, so the first thing is is that uh, that the house was all built on stage at Warner Brothers, the interior, and the exterior was a, a house in Glendale. Uh, Tim had the location manager looking around for a house that appeared to be a face with two windows above for the eyes 
and then uh, another window in the center for a nose, and then the mouth would be the door. He wanted the house to look like a character. That was his wish. And so we succeeded to, 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 to some level with that because it was somebody's house. And went back to the stage, uh, and uh, I just reviewed the drawings recently. I went to the Warner Brothers archives, and thank God they're all intact and safe. And the house was designed uh, with the bedroom. And, and uh, I don't know if people realize this, but in most cases, when you have a second floor of, of a house, it's usually on the floor of the stage. It's really not up, you know, 20 feet in the air. And what they usually do is uh, he uses a fire pole to get down to the first floor. But in most cases, you'll build the first floor on the stage with a staircase that would lead down the last few steps, and we'd build the second floor with the last few steps on a platform that would get him in there. So uh, we built it on stage. Uh, Paul brought a lot of things from his personal collection of toys, including the, the Howdy Doody uh, 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 puppet <laughs> and... Uh, the uh, a lot of work went into the design of that, and as a matter of fact, we, we had so little money that eventually they uh, said I couldn't build the living room and the dining room. So you can see on the drawings uh, at Warner Brothers where those two sets they have two big X's in them, which means delete, delete, delete. So we built the bathroom with the fish tank out the window. The kitchen was was fabulous. The uh, the wallpaper in the bedroom. And the wallpaper in the kitchen uh, was was new old stock wallpaper from the 1950s. It was the real deal that came from a place in New York called Secondhand Rose. You know, we found this wallpaper source, and so that wallpaper is all original from you know from mid century, from mid 20th century. And then we uh, designed a pattern for the uh, linoleum floor. The, uh, Tom Royston, I, I have to give great credit for, he was a set decorator on the show, and he found the wonderful washing machine tables, chairs, wall decor, uh, and, and, and Paul and Tim and I, and uh, uh, the special effects guy, Chuck Gaspar, uh, collaborated on the breakfast machine, you know, the Rube Goldberg machine. And so uh, all, all of those... Uh, sets on the stage which I have some nice images of but you're on the radio uh, they were all they were all built on stage and uh, they were slightly uh, surrealistic like the shape of the window behind his bed so after you go into the match dissolve from him being crowned at the Tour de France yes uh, to his face in the bedroom uh, Vicar Kemper was the cinematographer on, on most of those scenes and I, I thought it's quite beautiful. I, I, I was, like, shocked how beautiful it came out. And the toys, the fire pole, and then landing in the kitchen, uh, and then having his breakfast, and then going out to the bicycle, uh, which we, we built uh, uh, on the location, and with the tree, with the branch that pulls down, that opens the door, as I recall. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a pretty good set. I'm, I'm very proud of that. I think it's quite beautiful. So well, uh, what's your... And Next question. Well, see, well, here's a funny one. I'm located in um, San Antonio, Texas, uh, home of the Alamo. So I have a special fondness for the the Alamo sequence. Uh, so I'm curious how how that came about, and had you ever visited the Alamo before, and, or have you visited since? Uh, I I had been in Austin, Texas, a few years ago, and I was doing a small thing there for a few days and I wanted to get to the Alamo because I have never been to the Alamo before, during, or after Pee Wee. I was very disappointed that I didn't get to go there. But uh, if you'll notice in the shot, the camera is across the street uh, because it's a sacred monument uh, in the Texans. They would not allow us to film there. Uh, and so... Uh, the camera was across the street, and then Paul walks in and walks out, runs out after humiliating, being humiliated. The interior scenes of the Alamo were shot at the San Fernando Mission in the San Fernando Valley in California, with the, the very funny Jan Hooks from Saturday Night Live being the tour guide. 
That was a wonderful scene. I think it's hysterical. I think the whole movie is hysterical. It's one of my favorite. It's really my favorite comedy. That that. And, and I guess the last, the, the other, the, the big sequence is the, is the final sequence that's in the Warner Brothers lot, or supposedly the Warner Brothers lot. And so I gotta assume, as a production designer, that kind of gave you free reign of just doing all these kind of non sequitur jokes. Uh, from Godzilla to this and that, so I'm kind of curious of how did that how did that come about and how did that evolve that sequence? Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but Paul Rubens had been asked to come to Warner Brothers to uh, to, to come to Warner Brothers to do a film, and I can't remember what the subject was. But uh, uh, as he was at the studio working on something that had nothing to do with Pee Wee Herman at all, it was, I think he and Phil Hartman and Michael Varhol were working on something, he noticed that everyone in the studio rode around on a bicycle. You know, it's a tradition that goes back to, I'm sure, silent, silent picture days. And seeing everyone riding their bicycles around the lot is what inspired him to, to, to write Pee Wee's Big Adventure had nothing to do with his deal there. And he came up with the idea, and they wrote the story about the guy who loses his bike and it winds up being at a motion picture studio. So at the time we shot the film, uh, that studio was known as the Burbank Studios because Columbia Pictures had sold their lot on Sunset and Gower, where they had been since the beginning. And... uh, I guess it was hard economic times because they sold their facility and they merged the studio with Warner Brothers to share all the costs. Mm -hmm. So it was known as the Burbank Studio. So everywhere you look at the studio, at the main gate, all the signage, everywhere else, all that had to be made and changed from the Burbank Studios to Warner Brothers. It's very funny because today it's Warner Brothers again. And uh, so... The sequence came up with, you know, racing around the lot and then doing, you know, doing all the uh, uh, cliche, cliche settings like uh, beach blanket bingo, doing Godzilla, doing the the Christmas elf scene, and and it was very difficult because uh, we were on a very low budget and at the time we were shooting, they were shooting a film Goonies. Uh, that Richard Donner and Steven Spielberg and production designer Michael Reaver were doing a very big, big movie. So we were pretty much under the radar at a $7 million budget, and they just, you know, we were like kind of a joke, you know. No one bothered with us because they thought, you know, nothing. Nothing is ever going to happen with this film, but we'll let them make the film. And they were so preoccupied with Goonies, which was, was a very expensive film, uh, shooting music videos with Cindy Lauper in, in a pirate ship in the big tank on stage uh, uh, 16. I mean, it, they were all over the studio. So uh, I only had one stage where I had to do every sequence of him riding around the studio. What we would do is we would set the set for, for the beach party, you know, bring in tons of sand and backings. And, and by the way, you know, Tim always had it in his mind that all the studio stuff would look sort of, you know, cheesy, cheap, you know, cardboard. And and that was our intention, is to not make it look, you know, too glamorous and, and too production designed. And, of course, you've seen all his films since then, and you can see that the seed of those films lies in Pee Wee and, and in Frank and Weenie, you know. Very unique and unusual, and he didn't want me to go too far with making it too gorgeous, with the exception of Pee Wee's house, you know, interior. So we would do the set, and in those days, shooting on 35 millimeter film, what it meant was that the film had to go to the laboratory to be processed, and then you'd get a lab report that the film was not scratched or not damaged or overexposed, and and then you would know that well the film was safe. Well. I had, at the end of each day, we took the set apart and put the new set in before it even went to film check, which was, like, really dangerous, you know, like working without a net. So 
each each night we would change the set. The next day they come in and shoot the Santa Claus scene. The next day they come in and shoot the Godzilla scene. So all those sets were set aside. They were called, you know, folded off to the side, ready to go in. And you'll notice in, in all of those scenes, the camera very seldom turns in the other direction because that's where we were storing all the sets that had been pre-constructed. So the only problem was that every time he, he went in the, the elephant door, you know, the big load-in door, and go out, it was the same stage. It was like stage 21, stage 21, stage 21. Well, how could he be going in and out of the same stage so uh, without notifying anybody, I, I uh, had uh, the paint department get up on a, a lift and they changed the number on the stage. You know, the letters are like six feet high so that when the truck's coming into the studio, they know, you know, where to go. Well, it, it, it turned out to be like a, an What happened was that uh, after I changed the numbers, it was on a day of bad weather. Companies are out shooting uh, out on the street and it starts raining. They have to come back to the studio uh, to go into what's known as uh, cover set. And a and, uh, uh, cover set is a rain cover set. But because I had changed the number of the stage on the outside of the stage, there was a huge traffic jam of people trying to find their stage coming back to cover trying not to lose the whole day. So uh, I, I had to go into the office of uh, Fred Gallo, who is the head of production, and I pretty, uh, I took a pretty good beating changing the number on the stage and causing this huge confusion. But, you know, I, I just had to do it because it, it made sense to me that he wouldn't be going into stage 21 and coming out of stage 21 four times. And we shot that sequence, you know, in just, you know, like four or five days. I mean, you know, that, that, that movie was fast. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, there were a lot of scenes that were cut out, like uh, the Western Street on the back lot, which is on the DVD, but it's only in work print form. So I don't know where the original camera negative or the elements are, but the Western Street is now gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And it would have been a nice historical record of what it looked like. Uh, I I understand. I I think it was Burbank. I just read. I I don't know if it's Burbank Studios. They just unveiled. Uh, I think New York City Street. I think. Uh, that's Universal. Was oh, that Universal? Yeah. They had a big fire there, and they just uh, rebuilt 13 city blocks on the street. And actually, it's not even open for shooting until July the first. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually I may be actually shooting there uh, on my next film. Uh, in the Broadway section of the New York City streets. Uh, so, uh, and 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 uh, so, in any case, as Pee Wee is riding around a lot, we shot on the Brownstone Street. Uh, we shot in the uh, uh, the scene dock. We shot in in, in the uh, greens department. You know where they keep trees and plants. I, I, I believe that doesn't exist anymore. A lot of the things that you saw in the movie are no longer there. You know they've been removed because it's you know quarter of a century ago and the other sequences too that I, I thought were, were quite clever were in, in his nightmare sequence uh, we, uh, we see uh, the clowns and the ambulance and, and the stage and there, was, there wasn't much money to do that so I just painted everything black and did the checkerboard floor and forced perspective and put the archways there and we had so little money that I wanted to put neon lighting around the arches, you know, to accentuate them. But we couldn't afford it. It was too expensive. So uh, we got some uh, uh, fluorescent light fixtures, eight-foot light fixtures, and put some colored gel on them so that you look at the film and you'll notice that it just goes up the sides, but it doesn't take the configuration of the classic arch because we just didn't have the money. And, you know, I mean, it, seriously, the, the sets were all just a lot of paint and a lot of color. To Tom Roy's in, in the meeting, in the first production meeting, got up and uh, Paul Rubens and Tim Burton says, does everyone understand, does everyone understand, you know, because they were terrified they were making the first movie. And Tom Ackerman 
who had done films like Altered States, you know, major films, just stood up and said, yeah, I got it. If it ain't bright, it ain't right. And that was his motto, and that became the motto of the show. You know, everything had to be colorful. And and the other the other big note about that show that that we got really lucky with is I don't know if you've been to Los Angeles to the Third Street Mall in Santa Monica. It's a walking street closed off to traffic. At at the time we were making the film, uh, they had planned to make the Third Street Walking Mall, and so the leases had been terminated on all the stores on that street, like the Kinney Shoe Store and Newberry's and the theater. They, they were literally uh, tubes of a closed-down street. So we went in there, and we were able to create the town that Pee Wee lived in, unnamed town, and actually shot all of those exteriors on that street with no cars, no traffic, no police. We own the entire mall. Just in time, it was just, uh, you know, we were at the right place at the right time, and we turned the Kinney Shoe Store into the bicycle shop. Uh, we turned the other store into the magic shop. So we had interior sets and exterior sets that were exactly in the same location. Unlike Pee Wee's, Pee Wee's house, the exterior was in Glendale, and the interiors were on stage which meant every time someone went in or out, you'd have to cut. But at the bicycle shop, you'll notice TV walks in the door, you see the entire bicycle shop, he walks out the door, you see them all. It, 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 it's great production value that uh, we were so lucky to have, because I don't know what we would have done otherwise. I suppose we would have shot the street in the back lot that's been shot 10 million times, and it wouldn't have been as clever. Uh, and, and the buildings were real buildings. The camera, you could get it up on the rooftop and shoot angles down. You could shoot in every direction. And you can't do that on the back lot. You know, you'll, you'll do the, the, the settings that you want, but you can't necessarily turn the camera around because it's cost prohibitive to do the whole street. If you're doing a film like Blade Runner, where the street alone was a million two hundred thousand twenty five 25 years ago to do that street, you know. This is as the last question. In that, sure. when did you start? When did you start realizing that Pee Wee's Big Adventure was was growing in popularity, and not only just as a film through TV and DVD? And you know, I was I was of that generation that that came to it on TV as a kid, but also not only just as a phenomenon, but also that type of uh, production design, fantastical production design, was influencing other films and uh yeah well i'll tell you uh the story the story is is that uh when uh, uh unlike blade runner where i was around for the whole post-production process uh mm -hmm. after i did Wee's big adventure uh i went to madison wisconsin to do back to school with rodney dangerfield and sam Kennison and all those people so i wasn't around so uh i i uh I saw the film. I never saw, you know, the rough cut. I never went to the scoring session. And when I saw the movie at the Chinese theater at the premiere, which, which by the way, was covered live by MTV, when F MTV was MTV, when I saw that movie, I, I just, I, I'm telling you, my, my hair stood up on my arm. It, it was one of the greatest premieres I'd ever been to. Everybody knew that that movie was a huge hit that night. Steve Martin was there. Everybody was there. I mean, everybody in town came to see that movie, and it was the most sensational premiere I'd ever been to at the Chinese Theater. And the crowd went crazy. From, from, from the opening titles to, you know, with Danny Elfman's music, beginning to end, it had hit all over it. And then uh, Warner Brothers, you know, being the financier and distributor of the film, didn't know what to do with it because they'd never seen anything like it before. They'd never seen a Tim Burton film. They'd never seen Pee Wee. And so what happened was that uh, uh, they they released it in, in Denver, in Austin, Texas. I mean, you know, they released it everywhere except in the major... I think it was in four theaters, maybe seven theaters. They had no idea what to do with this $7 million movie because, again, they were still... 
you know, they were uh, distracted by goonies, you know, with costs and marketing and distribution. So all of a sudden, the film gets a $13,000 per screen average. Huge. I mean, it's really huge. It shocked the industry. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was a... Uh, there was a review in the New York Times. Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, the guy that reviewed. He gave it a really bad review, and at the end of it, he said that uh, he claimed that. Uh, in, in, uh, by the way, the movie is about a guy who lost his bicycle. You've been warned. In other words, it's it, it, a, 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 a bad movie, you know, a, a worthless movie. He he later. Uh, went on to correct himself weeks later, and then all of a sudden the picture opened, but it never went in more than 800 theaters in its whole run, and it cost $7 million to make, and it made like between 40 and $50 million. It was a huge, huge success. And and since that time, well, they, then Paul went in to do Pee Wee's Playhouse. And the whole thing has been great. I, I just came back from New York City, where I was invited to the Museum of Modern Art to introduce the film at the Tim Burton four-month retrospective of all his work. 25 years later, and it's like, you're calling me and the Museum of Modern Art. It, it, it's a lifelong movie. It, it, it's like a Charlie Chaplin, you know, uh, City Lights movie. It's, good, it's a forever movie. It'll never, it'll never be obsolete. It'll never be out of date. 